want to welcome you to our halftime report this year. Um, we're going to have a very special guest speaker, speaker here, Jonathan Rogers. I think you guys are going to get a lot out of hearing the things that uh, Jonathan has to say. He is about 100 times smarter than me, which isn't saying much, but um, I think you'll really learn something uh, from what Jonathan has to say. Uh, we do have some really great reading from the SEC and the lawyers. Be sure to pick one of these hard copies up. <laughs> Debbie has a hard copy of these that you can grab on your, on your way out, so don't forget to get that. Um, Dennis, you want to tell the folks a little bit about what's been happening at Align Wealth Management and maybe what we're going to talk about? Uh, just a quick update on the firm. So right now we serve 185 families. Um, the market's helped us a little bit this year, so now we're actually at about $245 million in assets under management, and now been in business for uh, a little over 24 years. And uh, I know we have some guests in the room, so I wanted to go through and, and introduce, you see a team picture up here. My name's Dennis Packard. Like I said, this is Brian Puckett. Um, we've got Laura just stood up, so wave Laura, Laura Payne. <laughs> and then we've got Darlene somewhere. Where is she? Now, oh, so Darlene Isel, and then Debbie's also in the back, and it's Debbie's 33rd anniversary, wedding anniversary, and tomorrow's her birthday. So I thought we'd all get up and sing happy birthday. No, just kidding. <laughs> you sure? <laughs> so today's agenda. Uh, first, Brian will give you a brief market update about what's happened the first half of the year. And then I'll go over just a review of, again, first half of the year, uh, how the, all our portfolios have performed and kind of, you know, probably what you've seen on your statements and everything. Uh, then we'll both go over the web resources we make available to all of you, including performance reports, financial plans, and access directly into your custodian to make sure, you know, you really know what's available out there for you to, to take advantage of. And then finally, we'll have a, like Brian said, Jonathan will come up and give a, a, a talk about behavioral um, economics, which is, you know, I think you'll find it really interesting, a lot about you know, how we manage money and why, and then we'll do a Q&A at the end. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what's been happening in the world over the past year. I, finally, this is the easy part of the presentation. I mean, it, it, the, the whole world, you know, global markets have re really been hitting on all cylinders. And some of the headlines up here, like new home sales hit their highest level uh, since before the housing crash in 2007. Uh, Trump was elected president. That may or may not be good in your book, but the market uh, seems to have liked it. Um, consumer confidence, which, you know, per spurs people to spend money on things like houses and cars and so on and so forth, is at the highest level in more than 15 years as measured by the University of Michigan. Uh, unemployment, 16-year low. Everybody knows that more jobs is a good thing for both the economy and the markets. Uh, and so everything is really good. I mean, I know that, you know, with oil prices the way they are, for those, of, uh, those in the room that are directly in the oil business, that's not a great thing for you personally, but it's a good thing for many, many other industries. So really, you know, there's a time and a place for everything. And many times at one of these meetings, it's all kind of, you know, there's one or two or many things negative to talk about. You know, the, the, most things look really, really good these days on many, many fronts, not just in the United States, but, but throughout the world. So, um, and if you take a look at the markets, it's really no surprise. Uh, the U.S. stock market um, and up here are really what the, the main asset classes that we invest in have done and then what our primary investments within those asset classes have done. The U.S. stock market, this is, again, this is only halfway through the year, first six months through June 30th, uh, 934. If it continues, which I have no idea whether it will continue, I have no shame in saying that because no one else has any idea, but 9% so far year to date, uh, pr pr pretty solid. Um, and our primary uh, uh, investment within that asset class, right in line with, with the market there. International developed, we have been, I know, I so appreciate the patience that you clients in the room have shown in us, because I know you've been to many of these over the past four or five years, and we've been saying just be patient. 
international stocks and emerging market stocks will turn around and you probably were going, yeah, well, this is about the tenth time I've heard that. When's that going to happen? Well, finally it's starting to happen. So you can kind of see international developed. 1282, our main investment there uh, did very well compared to the benchmark emerging markets. Take a look, doubled U.S. stock market. And again, our position there uh, did a little bit better. Global real estate, 3% um, year to date. Our position there, 375. Uh, the bond market, even though, you know, all the media says that when interest rates go up, the value of bonds go down, which actually, if you look at the last five interest rate hike um, cycles through a full cycle, that is not factual and not true. And this year, it's not factual and not true. The Federal Reserve raised interest rates, and the bond market's done, you know, just fine. So uh, the overall U.S. bond market, two, about 2.3%, and our primary uh, investment there, 2.6%. So, you know, everything looks pretty good. We did take a little of a breather. We, uh, in our portfolios, we tilt towards small and value stocks. Last year, you may or may not remember, but they just shot the lights out doing like 28 to 30%. So they're taking a little bit of a breather. But other than that, everything's really just kind of clicking on all cylinders. And uh, so it's a time to... Hope you guys are pleased with the returns you've seen on your statements, but it's it's nice to have some good news for once in a while. <laughs> Dennis? All right. Uh, so Brian just went over really what the markets did and, and a few positions that match up with those markets. Just wanted to go over what actual portfolio returns have been through uh, June 30th of this year. So this first one you see here is just our 100% stock portfolio. I know most of you actually, there's probably only three people in here, if that, that are in this portfolio of 100% stocks, I'm one of them. But uh, I just wanted to compare apples to apples to show you this dotted line is the S&P 500. This is starting in 1999, January 1st of 1999. And then our 100% stock portfolio. So you see this year, if you can see down there maybe, but S&P 500 is up 9.3%. Our portfolios are up 10.6%. Again, it's because for the first time in you know, four, four and a half years, international markets have outperformed, giving us that bump above the S&P 500. So something I want to point out though, is if you look at the returns over here on the right side, that's the return of the portfolio from January of 1999 to the end of 2016. And if you can't see it, the, uh, our 100% stock portfolio is up 7.8% annually in that time. The S&P 500 is up 5.3%. So, okay, that's good, that's a percentage, but that's 2.5% annually, which might, you know, I kind of feel like that's, that's a good number, but it might not sound like a lot, that 2.5%, but if, this is what we're, you hear us talking about, you know, a lot of what Jonathan will go over, we're always looking at, you know, where can we make another half percent, or where can we save half a percent, where can we save a little money, because every little bit helps. And so this is a good example, that 2.5%, so with a 7.8% return, if you had a million dollars in January of 1999, in our portfolio you'd have $4.2 million. If you had an S&P 500, only 2.5% less every year, you're at 2.7. So that little bit adds up over time. And that's you know, 18 and a half years right there. So that's about 55% more money just because of that 2.5%. Dennis, I hate to interrupt, but what about fees? How does that how does that account? Yeah, so these are returns <coughs> net of fees. So after your fund cost, ARC fees, this is actually the returns you've seen for the ones, again, most of you aren't in this 100% stock portfolio, but I'll go over the other ones. But I'm getting ready to go to the, the other, some of our other portfolios. It's net of all fees. And the way we do that is just, it's composite of everyone in that mix. It's your actual returns you see all compiled together. Do you charge the fees? Fun fees, yeah. I don't charge myself a management fee, though, no. <laughs> this, no. I think, though, I'm not in that. You correct me if I'm wrong. This yeah. is net of all fund fees, management fees, TD Ameritrade, Schwab fees, net of all fees, right. I believe. And mine's not in this, because that wouldn't be fair. So. Oh, do you, char <laughs> do you charge yourself fees? Yeah, what? that's right. There you go. No. And for those of you that are pretty new to us, I mean, you know, we... 
I mean, I try to tell people our program is really, you know, we're not trying to hit home runs. It's singles and doubles and singles and doubles. And, sing and we don't live over, this is 18 years worth of performance data. And it's just not very exciting right in the beginning. But I see some faces in the room of some people that have been with us for 18 years. And at least when I look at your statement, I, those numbers that I see are pretty exciting to me. I'm going, man, that's a, you know, so. And again, it's not always a bed of roses, but this year it's, it's, it's pretty nice, so. So far. So this is the same information, just added some additional portfolios in here. I know most of you are probably, I can't say it too well, the 60% stock to 70, the 75. So most of you are in this range. You see the 60% stock portfolio is up 7% through um, June 30th, and the 75% is up almost 9%. So again, pretty good returns the first half of the year. And then really, you know, to point out, you know, the green line you see up here is only 40% stocks, 60% bonds. The yellow one is 60% stocks, 40% bonds. And if you noticed right here, I mean, they're still above the S&P 500, even though we're taking about 40 to 60% of the risk of the stock market, much less risk. But you see why we got much less volatility. You know, it's the point A to point B, the shortest distance is what? It's a straight line. And so you see they just don't have the ups and downs, so it stays you know, right there in between. Now it's catching up. You have, well, you, know, you have some good years in a row that, that might catch up with those. Okay, so we just wanted to make sure that everybody in the room uh, understood what kind of um, information that, are, that we make available to you guys so that, I mean, we are totally committed to being completely transparent in our efforts to keep you informed about your hard-earned money. And there's three tabs on our homepage that are particularly useful to you. Number one is performance reports. Number two, we think more important is the financial plan report. If you have not put us to work on a financial plan, I would really encourage you to do that. I mean, the technology in this area has really, really improved in the financial planning. I think the financial planning work that we're doing today is so customized and, and, and for the clients that engage in it, it's, it's so helpful. Um, and then finally, your custodian, you can log in directly to your custodian. As you guys know, we don't custody any assets. This prevents the Bernie Madoff problem. Bernie Madoff held custody of the assets. We're just the advisor. So all assets that we manage are either at TD Ameritrade or Charles Schwab in your name or as you direct in your trust or whatever the case may be. And this, this is all, I'm going to go through these things and you'll see there's a lot of checks and balances that are set up primarily uh, for your safety, for the security of your assets, and therefore, your, you know, for your peace of mind. Um, but performance, you know, a lot of advisory firms don't like to talk about performance. Performance matters. It matters a lot. And, uh, you know, we can have nice events like this and feed you good food and wine and all that kind of stuff. But we know our job is to make your money work as hard as you did for it and to make sure that your financial plan shows that you're never likely to run out of money and maybe leave that money behind to, you know, a charity or your loved ones at the, uh, at the end of the day. So I want to kind of click on some of the uh, performance um, reporting tools that are available to you. And I might mention as well, checks and balances. We're always trying to set things up, checks and balances, and have that be obvious to you guys as clients. So uh, not to go back to the negative, I'm going to try to keep the whole meeting as positive as possible today. Um, but, you know, Bernie Madoff produced his own performance report. So he could say whatever he wanted. It was 8% a year and 8% a year and 8% a year. Well, we don't produce any of our own performance reports. Dennis pulled all those performance numbers that you just saw out of a completely third party, one of the largest third party performance reporting and portfolio accounting firms in the world, Tamarack, which is part of the InvestNet group. So we don't calculate our own numbers. Therefore, there's an yet another checks and balance. So you go to our webpage, you sign in here. If you have, I would really encourage encourage everybody to get in here because there's lots of great data in there. I really encourage you to do it now while your account's up, by the way, because uh, uh, it won't always be that way, as we know. Anyway, if you forgot your username and password, you can do the recover password. If you get stuck, don't get frustrated. Don't stay stuck. Call uh, Darlene. Is Darlene back yet? Because we're helpless without you. Uh, Darlene will help you get logged into the 
Were you going to say something, Dar? <laughs> <laughs> that's about, if you've worked with Dar, you know that that's how she, she doesn't talk much, but man, when she does or when you need something, she can get it done. Uh, so the next page, let's just kind of, so this is what you see when you first log into that performance reporting system. And it's very simple on purpose. This whole thing and the user interface has been designed and modified and honed over the years based on client feedback about what clients really want to see. So this is what you see when you first log in. It's your whole account. I, I think this is an actual account, although I'm not positive. You put all this together. But here's all your money, and here's basically what it's done. I think that this means since inception to date. And then this line right here is kind of what you've put in, less what you've withdrawn. And then this is your gain or loss up here. And as you can see, this is all gain. This is what this particular client uh, put in. And then if, you, if you're one of those people kind of like me that likes to get really, you know, into the details and, you know, drill down and drill down, the next page allows you to do that. You can go as a... Uh, Let me, before you get into that too, oh, okay. on every screen Brian's going to go through, when you first log in, you'll notice right up here, it's your household. And so you can see everything is a household. If you've got three accounts with us, four mm. accounts, whatever, you go click on this and you can drag down and pick an account and it'll have all this information just for that one account. So you can view every, every report you go over, everything that Brian's gonna cover here, you mm -hmm. can do as a household level or report level. But really, you know, the household ones is what matters. We, we will sit with you and help you to look, you know, make sure you understand if you want to use this. But this is the way I look at my own accounts. I don't look at TD Ameritrade where I have all my money. And I find it to be very, very useful. And, uh, you know, I can't see two feet in front of me without my, without my glasses. For those of you that are new to me, I'm kind of like Mr. Magoo. I mean, I can't hear in one ear now. I can't see. My brain's still good, I think, but... Mostly. Uh, <laughs> in any event, this is where you can kind of go in and drill down. And you click here under reports, and you can get you know, your account performance, which is what this uh, chart here, this sort of shows the growth of wealth over time. And then you can click over here under summary, which I'm going to come to in a minute, which will really tell you what every investor that I've ever talk to all they really want to know is, and maybe this maybe this will make sense to you maybe it won't but hey Brian what did I start with what have I put in what have I taken out what have I gained or lost and what do I have today does that make sense and you look at I mean I just looked at a brokerage statement yesterday from one of the largest firms in the world it starts with an M. It goes like Morgan and you know, something like that. And it's this real pretty looking detailed statement and everything. And we go through every page of the statement. And nowhere on there is the primary thing that someone needs to know about their performance. What's the most important thing, Claude, about performance? Huh? What you have left. Well, yeah, but, but like your rate of return, right? I mean, everywhere on the whole statement was, here's the holding, here's how many shares you have, here's the yield. And the only thing good on this statement was there was a lot of income producing stuff on the statement. And, you know, it may make you feel good, when, you know, that your, their, your, your yield is higher, but that's only because your price has gone down. So have you really made any money? So what matters is your total return. Does that make sense to everybody? And all these brokerage firms, they hide the truth from us. So what we're trying to do is, is, is pierce the, all that baloney and get to what really matters, what's your rate of return? It's kind of like, and I'm, I'm gonna, I try to be authentic most of the time, but today I, I'm gonna be inauthentic. And that is, I know that when I try to lose weight, I have to measure what matters. I have to get on the, Scale. Yeah, scale and look at the pounds, right? You, have somebody else? you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> well, in, in, when you're when you're talking about a portfolio, you got to look at you be able to see that first of all, be able to see the truth. And the thing that matters most, just like in losing weight, it's the pounds. Are you? It's the rate of return. You know. So so what, go on through. There's a whole bunch of stuff in here. If you drill down like into transactions, you can see every trade, every you know, every dividend that was paid, every amount of interest that was paid is as, as, as meager 
secret as it is. And every fee from either us or TD Ameritrade, every deposit, every withdrawal, everything down to the penny. So we try to be just as transparent as possible. For those of you in the room that want to, you know, see every little detail, you can have that. You know, if you're, you know, if you're one of those people that really just want to say, okay, give me the bottom line, then the summary page, I think, really kind of answers what most folks want to know, and that is, what did I start with? What did I, what did I, you know, what did I turn over to you guys to handle for me? I, I worked hard, y'all worked hard for this money. So how much of my hard-earned money did I give you? How much have I taken out? What, how much have I earned in dividends? How much have I earned in interest? And what's my ending value? And therefore, what is my rate of return? So that right there under that summary, you click on that reports tab and click on summary, Bam, anywhere you are, 365 days a year, from anywhere in the world, you can know the most important thing, what's my rate of return? So, makes sense. If you're not using it, please get in there, get your password, don't get frustrated. If you can't get your password, get us on the phone. Darlene will you know, uh, interface with Tamarack and get that to you, but it's a pretty valuable tool, really. I mean, how, Darlene, how long does it take if they don't have one, if they call us? To get them a password and everything. Yeah. So we can get that to you and you can log in. Oh, uh, right here? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. It, it's nerd talk. It, it stands for time weighted rate of return. That's how we have to record it. <laughs> so the next tab up here, uh, Brian's mentioned it. So the second one is the financial plan. and. Really, to us, this is the most important, one of the most important services we provide to you guys is having a financial plan that you, you know, we can monitor. You know, are you on track? Do you have any concern or ever run out of money? Because that's not going to happen under our watch. So we would just continually monitor this, update it as things change, as you know, things do change. So, you know, work together with you on it. So for those of you who have done that, you might have logged in here. If we have one and we, you don't have a login, again, just give us a call and we'll send you a link. You can get right in, get your password, and, and get in. It's pretty simple. You know, if you forgot it, same thing. There's a forgot your password. You can go in there. But again, let us know. We'd be happy to, to get you in there. For those of you who ha we have not done that, we've done a plan for most of you in here. I just want to give you a quick overview for those that haven't. Um, and maybe a review for some of you that haven't uh, looked at your plan in a while. But uh, Really, I mean, this is all about you. I mean, the, the performance reports, again, it just goes over what's happened in the investments and things like that. This is really, this is your life. This is just a snapshot of it. There's much more detail to it, but it's just, okay, what are your goals? You know, what do you want to happen? When do you want it to happen? You know, this is a more, maybe a pretty detailed one, but, you know, living expenses. They said we want, you know, to spend $150,000 a year. We put out healthcare as a separate one. Of course, you got to pay for that, and that gets more and more expensive. So we inflate that, you know, more than double the rate of everything else. But you know, we want to take a special trip. We need to buy cars every five or six years, or whatever it is. So all these things you need to buy. It's your goals. It's nothing we come up with. It's just what do you want? And tell us what you want to see happen. And then down here, then we've got you know the investments. We automatically everything we manage is automatically linked in to where it updates every time you kind of like the performance reports. It's always up to date. And then we can add in outside accounts, bank accounts, 401ks, things like that. If you have something you can log in, we can actually link that to where that's updated real time. And so you really get yeah you know, the performance reports is what we're doing. This is more of a big picture of your whole financial life all in one place. You can see everything I've got. You can put in your liabilities and credit card points and I mean everything out there and just get a snapshot. Then what we do is we just look at okay here's what you own. Here's your assets. Here's your investments. What do you own it in? How much is it in stocks and bonds and different all these different types and just run a thousand scenarios on based on historically what's happened with those types of investments and just look at are you on track? You know, this one's 83%. We want it between 80 and 90. Yeah, you're fine. Or if it's, you know, sometimes we'll get in there at your 95. What else do you want to do? You can go do more. You can go spend more money. You only got one, you know, or, or you want, you know, this one was leave 500,000. You can leave more if you want or gift more. Whatever. It's, it's you. Some people are like, that's it. I'm spending it. Yeah, I'm not going to spend that much and uh, we'll just leave it there. That's fine. 
but we just want to be there for you and you know if it gets down below 80 if we get to 70 or 75 what adjustments do we need to make you know do we need to make an adjustment to the investments or do we need to make adjustments to spending or and that way you you don't have you know the number one thing we hear in that first meeting is i want to make darn sure i don't run out of money i'm so worried about running out of money this is how we do it and we got a kind of a warning if it starts getting low we tell you hey let's do something to make sure that doesn't happen um, another thing I'm going to cover for those of you who have done one is if you do log in, I mean, of course you can view it and see where you're at, but there's also things like, you know, this play zone and what are you afraid of and things like that. So, you, you know, hopefully you're not watching and listening to CNBC or media or something like that, but what if inflation's higher than expected or what if, what if one of us needs to go into long-term care or, you know, in a nursing home? What if... Yeah, you know, Social Security is cut, which, yeah, I don't think you need to worry about that, but just things like that. So you can go in there and play with it and see how that affects your plan. Then finally, the third one is just the custodian tab. And what that'll do is that'll bring up the two custodians we use. You click on the logo, TD Ameritrade for there, or Charles Schwab. It'll bring that page right up, and you just log in. And the same, Darlene, I'm going to ask you on that. What if they don't know their login for that? Just call you? All right. That's a little harder because they don't give us any information, but on purpose that we can't access it. Jonathan? All right. Well, well, thank you to Brian and Dennis for, for uh, inviting me down here to Oklahoma City to talk to you. It's been a couple of years since I've stood in front of this group and met a, met a few of you. It's been about five years that Forum and Align have worked together. Uh, Forum Financials, uh, a firm out of sh Chicago, uh, has a very similar investment philosophy to Align. Uh, our investment committee is, is part of the group. I co-chair that committee uh, along with another University of Chicago MBA. And we have five of our advisors who have between 25 and 30 years of experience on that investment committee who helped put together a lot of the ideas and the investment models uh, behind what Align has put into place over the last five years. Uh, we'll then consult with a dozen or so other like-minded firms around the country, uh, high-quality firms, uh, Line being one of those. We'll talk to those firms and, and bounce those ideas off of Align, off of Brian and Dennis. We'll call Dimensional fund advisors, which many of you have heard about dimensional fund advisors. We have a direct line into their uh, co-chair, uh, global uh, co-chair of their investment committee and, and the head of research there. So we'll bounce all of these ideas off of their research group as well. So everything that we do within the uh, models, everything that Align does that's within the models is well vetted, not just across Align, but also across Forum and the other firms that we work with. So that's who I am, why I'm here talking to you is that, that I'm very much involved in the creation of each of your portfolios and, and how they're invested and why we invest internationally and why we invest in DFA. So those sorts of questions I can answer as we go along here. But I wanted to touch a little bit on behavior, not just the, the numbers side of it, but a little bit on, on not client behavior as much as like human behavior. Okay? So what is, you know, what is behavioral economics is and why do we need to be concerned about it? All of us are human. And to err as human, we're all, we all have cognitive biases. So you've heard that term out of different psychology and other places. Cognitive biases are things that we are hardwired to do. We are hardwired to, when we see a, a predator, turn and run or fight, right? That flee, fight, fight or flee uh, mentality. These various behavioral biases come from living for thousands of years and the savannah, and then now we're living in front of computer screens. But we still have these same concepts, and they still affect how we behave in practice. So one of the things I want to talk about is market indicators. We're very good pattern uh, seekers. As humans, we connect dots. If you, give, if, so you give somebody two dots, they will draw a straight line between those two dots every single time. They'll automatically do that in their head. That's what they will think of. They will not think of a loopy curve that goes out to the right and then comes back to the second dot. <laughs> We tend to think but, uh, that we can extrapolate out from whatever data we're giving, there will be a conclusion from that data that I can draw about the thing that, I, that I'm concerned about, the thing that I'm thinking about. Well, so one of the things we tend to get into is, and sorry if these are a little bit small, but if you can read these, there's lots of different things people point to and say, what's going on right now in the world? And what does that mean for stocks in the next month? or next day or next week. I'm going to talk about months because I, my shortest time frame I typically think about is months when I'm thinking about the stock market. 
Okay, so when I'm thinking about, you know, what are things out there that I could use to predict the stock market? You go through a lot of data, and, you know, there's PhDs in every uh, economics and business program across the United States and the world that are looking at this, trying to create patterns that would predict stock markets. What things predict stocks, what things predict economic cycles, and what things predict neither? We're going to play a little game here. Actually, I'm not going to make you do that because ultimately there's one of these things on this board that actually can predict stock markets. The problem is it doesn't predict stock markets very well in the short term. It can't tell you what's going to happen next week. What it can tell you is whether stocks will generally do better or worse than average. It still always predicts a positive result over the next 20, 30, 40 years. And that's equity P.E. ratios. So we can toss that one over here into predicting stock markets. P.E. ratios don't tend to say what's going to happen in the next month or six months or something like that. So you can't make adjustments within your portfolio based upon it. So the Schiller P.E. ratio, if you've heard of that one or various other iterations of it. But it can tell you generally stock markets will not be as good as they have been in the last 90 years. If you go back to 1926, I guess that's 91 years, 92 years. Um, stock markets have averaged around 10%. P.E. ratios tell you it'll probably be a little lower than that. But do I know if it'll be 8% or 9% or 7%? No, I couldn't tell you. It'll be somewhere lower than 10, though, probably, is roughly what that P.E. ratio can tell you. And that's about the next 30 to 50 years. So that's what I'm that, that is actually a successful way to pick stock markets. The other ones listed here, I'll go through a couple of them. Uh, let's start with GDP growth. People talk about how GDP growth, and they say, What's the, well, GDP growth is accelerating, so that should be a good thing for the stock market. Stocks actually predict GDP, not the other way around. This is often what, this is one of the most common things I get from client meetings is we're always talking about economic uh, indicators. So I, I've given away the secret here, but anything economic indicator related here, stock market tends to predict those variables as opposed to those things being predictors of the stock market. So we can toss GDP over there into that predicts economic cycles, not stock markets. Uh, likewise, likewise, interest rates are often in the, in the uh, you know, you're listening to the talking heads on TV and they'll talk about how interest rates are going up or going down and those are predictors of the stock market. That is not true. Uh, interest rates are very hard to predict themselves and where they're going to go next and it's the change in interest rates that have an effect on your bonds and stock prices. So repeating what I just said, because I said something that had a little bit of a nuance there, it's the change in interest rates going forward that will have an effect. So if it changes to the positive or changes to the negative, that does have an effect on stocks and bond prices. But the problem is standing here today, I can't tell you whether that change will be greater or less than what's predicted today. And therefore, I can't tell you what's going to happen to the stock market. So yes, the yield curve predicts interest rates will go up a certain percent, and I can interpolate back exactly what that percentage prediction is for a month, like a year, whatever period. But the thing that will affect the stock markets is whether or not that price that's built into today's yield curve is too high or too low of an increase. That's the thing that actually has an effect on stock prices, and that's very, there's not been any, um, there's been very little research that says that that's a, a predictable uh, change. Okay, so interest rates get put over, they do actually predict economic cycles somewhat because it takes a while for interest rate changes to work through the economy, so you, you tend to see the effect in the numbers in a, in a lagged way. So they actually do predict economic cycles. Um, oil prices, likewise. There are periods when oil prices are up and stock markets are down. There's a lot of periods when our oil prices are still up, but economics are up, or stock markets are up. Oil prices and economics have very low correlations. So low that if you do the, the statistical uh, analysis of them, you will say that there is not a clear short-term prediction between oil prices and stock markets. I can go, I can send somebody a couple of research papers if they want to go into more detail. I think that's probably a bad topic to dive into too much detail in this room, so I'm going to move on. Uh, oh, S&P 500, I got them slightly out of order. So I'd already talked about S&P 500. Stock markets predict economic cycles. So that one gets put in the middle bucket. Volatility doesn't predict either. And I'm just going to speed things up and put the rest into economic cycles because I think we got the hint of how that story is going. There's very few things that actually predict the stock market because stock market prices are predictions themselves and incorporate all of that information into the stock price. That's a, that is what a stock market does is it is a weighted average best guess given all of these inputs on where the markets are going to go in the, in the future. 
So that's number one. So I'm just going to use one of these as, as an example of some of the data behind um, this. This is volatility for uh, is this example. So we looked, and actually DFA is the one that, that did this, the specific numbers that I put on this slide. Um, but so DFA, I'll, I'll do it in DFA terms, so I'll re reference their study as opposed to forums, uh, looked at volatility in the past. And so for the prior month, average volatil volatility in the prior month, so if there's above average volatility, things have bounced around a lot in the stock market, should that make stock market's prices going forward higher or lower is the question. So if we've just experienced a lot of volatility, you would tend to think, oh no, the, the world has had some major news come out, that's bad for stock prices, we should get out of the market or we should maybe pull a little off the table. But if you look at volatility and then you look at the return on the month following, it's 1.01 versus 0.98. That's an inconsequential difference. Both of them are right at 1% for the following month return. So short-term volatility does not predict stock markets, even though you'll hear that uh, whenever they're talking on you know, CNBC or wherever else, they'll talk about how stock markets are really volatile right now, it may be a good time to get out. That's a bad conclusion to reach. Um, this is a visual uh, of the exact same thing. I don't think I'm gonna go into that. If you want to see this slide in detail, I'm sure Brian can explain it extremely well, right, Brian? <laughs> no, I, I, I won't put him on the spot, but basically what you do, you, no matter how high volatility gets, you have a lot of positives and you have a lot of negatives ab above and below that line. No matter how high volatility gets to the right, it, there's no clear line, there's no pattern that says that it should be negative or it should be positive. If, if there was a correlation between the two, you would see this trend, you'd see these grouped together above or below the line once you get out into the higher volatility. So that's the visual representation of why there's not a correlation between previous volatility and future stock prices. Okay? Another topic that I wanted to touch on because it comes up all the time uh, in client meetings is discrete assets. So the word discrete, and the reason I picked that word instead of another synonym like tangible, is because there's actually two parts of this. One is that discrete assets tend to be tangible. They tend to be things that we can touch and feel, like paper. So the company that makes paper, I feel more comfortable investing in a company that produces something that I'm familiar with. Um, there's also a second definition of the word discrete, and that is a discrete outcome is one in which there's a limited set of outcomes, so that you may get zero dollars or a thousand dollars from investing this hundred dollars. That's a discrete um, event. It means that there's there's not a lot in between. You're either going to do really well or do ver or do below uh, expectation. So the, the reason I'm going to talk about those two definitions of the word discrete is because there's a lot of examples of this. Um, oil and gas wells, for example, or uh, marijuana farms has been in the news lately. Individual companies like Amazon where you can touch your iPhone, you say, I know iPhone, I really like how my iPhone works, so I'm going to invest in that company. Uh, Google, Microsoft, a lot of the tech companies now are the ones that we think about as being the investments that come up again and again in, in clients' portfolios as individual investments in those individual companies. So. While we may feel comfortable, as, as human beings, we feel more comfortable with something that we can look and touch and feel, that does not necessarily mean it's a better investment. So that's what I want to drive home here a little bit. Um, oil and gas, I, again, I'm speaking to the crowd here um, that knows, knows it far better than I do, but has anyone ever heard of uh, Andrew Herman? Made a, billions of dollars on betting long as the oil prices were increasing, opened a hedge fund. Uh, uh, basically, yesterday there was a news article that he has closed down his hedge fund because he, while he was one of the best investors in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, has not been able to continue that streak of predicting oil prices. Of course, yesterday, actually today, I think it was that the Shell refinery uh, went up in flames a little bit over in, in Holland. But So you never know what news events are going to come out. Whenever you're investing in a single thing like oil and gas or like a single oil and gas well, for example, you don't know what things will affect that one specific investment. So if you're doing an oil well, you don't know what uh, unforeseen uh, events will take place that would cause that one oil well to do poorly, even if multiple oil wells would have been a good investment. And not to say that they would be, but you, when you're investing in a single thing, 
there are things that can affect a single company or a single location, a single piece of real estate that cannot be predicted and that can create a zero or very low negative outcome. So what happens in these kind of individual investments is you tend to get this, I'll use it again, I'm gonna use a few nerdy terms here and I apologize, I just can't get by a day without doing it, so I will try my best to explain them, but the distribution of discrete investments like this, you have some very, very big winners, so 1,000% return, 2,000% returns, but if the average of all of the investments is a 10% return, you have to have a lot of losers to offset every single winner because you have very, very high returns from the winner. If the average is 10%, I've got to have a lot of zeros and 50% and losses in order to average out to that 10%. So anytime you're doing individual investments, what you end up happening, what ends up happening in those, because they have some very big winners, the expected return from any, in, any one investment, the median ex expectation, is actually below the average return of that asset class. Because you have these big winners, you have more below the average than above in terms of numbers of investments. That's why it becomes very risky to invest in any one company, any one oil well, any one of these sorts of things that can have discrete outcomes where you have really big winners, you have a lot more losers than it's not even, it's not on either side. If you take the average, there's not as many on the right as there are on the left. Actually, for y'all, that's right. People only tell you about their winner. Of, hey, you don't talk about the loser at the golf course. No. Only I talk about losers at golf courses, apparently. But um, So let, let, me, let me just touch on that. So the, the companies. So those are the, some of the hot names today. Have you all seen this slide? No. Has Brian used this slide for you? In their day, many of these companies were the bluest of the blue chip. There were some extremely well-respected companies in their day. Uh, another fact. Uh, Dow Jones, everybody knows the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Anybody know how long that's been around? I don't either. <laughs> um, but what I do know is whenever it started, there's only one company that remains that was originally on that list. Can anybody tell me that one company? Delta. It's not Johnson & Johnson. Delta. Good guess. Delta. Not Delta. Delta. It's not Dell. It is GE. You cheated. No. <laughs> it is GE. So GE has survived. It's the only original member of the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. There are other companies that have merged and that have parts of those companies still exist within Dow, Dow Jones, but that is the only one that still exists as its own company. But what is GE now? Do they make just electrical parts? No. No. They have investments that are extremely diversified. So what does that tell you? It tells you maybe we should be, if we're investing for the really long term, instead of investing for a single stock, in a single stock, in a single company, maybe we too should be invest, invested in a diversified portfolio. It's the only one that stuck around since the beginning of the Dow Jones. Maybe call it 120 years ago. It's a good guess for when it, that average started. Okay. Um, this is chart, you've seen, so you've seen it a lot, I won't touch on it very much. Bonds, since 1926, have returned between 10 and $20 on a dollar. Stocks uh, have in, uh, returned 6,000 to one over that same period. So it started with a dollar, the S&P 500, basically US large cap, becomes $6,000 since 1926. It's the compounding of equity markets is, and that diversified investment that will outlast over the long run. That's kind of what I want to emphasize on that portion. So I wanted to kind of touch on how we try to keep our own behavioral biases out of the uh, investment process. So how does Forum and Align uh, invest? Well, first of all, we constantly remind ourselves that we are just as subject to these behavioral biases as anybody else in this room. Um, so we, we constantly remind ourselves not to try and fight the market. Uh, this comes up in our investment committees. We, we, we talk about it, uh, but we try not, whenever we're creating our trading uh, algorithms and, and ways in which we rebalance your portfolios and when we should rebalance your portfolios, all of those numbers and metrics, we try to incorporate the stock price and, and use that information as opposed to beating or fighting the stock markets. There's lots of people that have tried to use you know, the double candlestick before Black Monday or economic indicators like we were talking about before. There's one study that actually had pretty high predictability based on total aggregate rainfall. 
uh, in the United States as a predictor of stock markets, and I don't know why that would be correlated. But um, uh, yeah. It's very possible that the, predict the, the, the production of butter in Bangladesh yeah. is just as good of a predictor, yeah. but that's what you call data mining. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there's lots of people putting lots of data, and with computers, we can crunch through uh, just, uh, not gigabytes, but um, just massive quantities of data now very, very quickly, and you will find patterns. If you dump enough data into a system. You will find patterns. They will not be good patterns, and they will not continue, but you will find patterns. <laughs> but we remind ourselves of that, so we try, not to, we try to avoid that kind of an approach. Um, why, why do we think another reason we shouldn't fight markets is because they react very, very quickly. And so we don't want to react when markets are reacting. We want to let markets figure out the right stock price. And DFA does a very similar thing, so I'll talk about that in a second. But this is just one quick example about how quickly stock markets adjust whenever there's new information. So this was uh, Heinz that agreed to be bought out by Berkshire Hathaway. Um, February 14th was the date of the article. Let me, I'll just let you guess what the date is right there. That's the exact same day. In minutes, the stock market can adjust to new information. Sometimes in seconds, if it's, if it's publicly known information and, and clearly known what the outcome is, it can react in seconds. So we don't try to get out in front of news. If we see news in the newspaper, it's already too late. <laughs> Especially with the Oklahoma paper, I did not say that. <laughs> the Chicago person did not say that, just to, just to be clear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so news travels quickly. We don't try to get out in front of news events because we know we won't be the first person there. We know that we will be late to that game every single time. Um, likewise, DFA, even though they've got 500 uh, billion under management, will not be the first person there either, and they know that. So what they try to do is use stock market prices, use that as good information, and then wait for people to come to them and demand liquidity. So. Uh, every day in the, in, the, in the world, there's an, on average 82 million trades every single day. It's a lot of trades. So what DFA does is they say that's a lot of liquidity. Whatever securities we want to buy today, we'll probably be able to buy those, if not today, in the next coming days. But we want to be patient about it. And so one of the analogies they actually came up with to describe this was cars. If you're going to buy a green sports car and I need it today, and the salesperson knows that, you're not going to get a very good price. So what DFA does is they go to the market every single day and says, we want to buy all of these cars, or we want to sell all of these other set of cars, and their traders will receive an order for sometimes hundreds of securities any given day, and the portfolio manager, who's the trader's boss, will say, get as many as you can. If you come back with none of them, that's fine. If, there's, if none of those uh, stocks, there's somebody demanding liquidity on the other side, then don't trade. Just wait until there's somebody demanding liquidity and pushing prices. So that's how DFA trades. Is they trade on a very, very slow, uh, very patient basis to try and always take advantage of people who do come into the market and say, I really want that green sports car, and there's nobody selling green sports cars, or there's not very many green sports cars being sold that day. DFA will come in and say, we'll provide you with that green sports car. We'll take the other side of that trade because they know that there's going to be price pressure that particular day on that security. So that's how DFA trades. So it's things like that that you can do within the markets that still say we think the market prices are great, but there's ways we can implement more efficiently than other people in the market. That's just one of the examples. Uh, we don't do that. DFA does the intraday trading. We do the daily rebalancing, the, the monitoring of your portfolios every day. But we do similar kinds of processes. Um, I want to touch on global. Uh, Brian already mentioned or alluded to the fact that it's been a great year for international investing, so it's nice to talk about it when it's in the, in the favor as opposed to out of favor. But a lot of people haven't seen this kind of a perspective. Uh, this is the global stock market weight of U.S. and international markets uh, since 1990. So it just gives you a sense of where the U.S. was, where the U.S. is today, and how much emerging markets have become a, a part of that overall market. Now, obviously, these markets have grown 
substantially. So I'm not showing the growth of the markets. I'm factoring it all down to 100%. But this gives you an idea of kind of the balance of US and international today and how we kind of track that balance within our portfolios. Because we don't know when the S&P 500 is going to be up or down. So Brian also mentioned that in the last few years, we've got five years here out of the last, what is that? Uh, eight, five of the last eight years, the S&P 500 did significantly better than international. So recent, that's another bias that we have, recency bias. We always think about the last few years, we always forget about 15 years ago. Not all of us, but I'm, you know, many, many of us are prone to doing so. Um, well, if you take the 10 years before that, you notice where the S&P 500 is relative to, this is the weighted, kind of, kind of a global allocation. It was right at the bottom of the stock market, of the, of the different asset classes. So yes, it will have years when the S&P 500 is in favor, and yes, it will, there will be years where it's not in favor relative to international. We want to hold it in both, because that'll give you a smoother ride over the course of time. The global, you'll notice the global um, diversified equity balance strategy is what it's called. It's a DFA kind of blend, but uh, that's right kind of smack in the middle of the different asset classes. So it gives you a smoother ride over time. So that's just touching on that. We're not going to hit on it because, again, internationals actually come back this year, and so it's a positive thing, staying that diversified. But we want to be diversified because we don't know which year it's going to be positive or negative. There's no clear pattern. So what do we do in terms of differences from the market? And, and one of those things is tilting to di various factors because they have higher expected returns. So your portfolio isn't just the market. It is the market. It has almost every security in the market is in your portfolios. But they're weighted differently than the markets. And why do we do that? We do that because there's not just one risk that's out there. It's not just market risk. There's also smaller companies that tend to have more risk. Value companies and, pro and low profitability companies all tend to have, um, and, and high profitability companies all tend to have uh, greater risk than the stock markets. So you would expect a greater expected return from those factors. All of those have been found through uh, academics. So it's, we're not discovering these factors. Uh, Brian's not sitting there running regressions trying to figure out what these factors are. These are all coming from academia uh, and are vetted through DFA and through our investment committee and through Align and their team. These are factors that are robust and that seem to have uh, higher expected returns over time. And there's a coherent story for that as well. So for example, example, small companies I think is fairly intuitive why a small company would be riskier than a big company. Let's take growth and value. Which one has a higher stock appreciation expectation? It's not growth companies. It's one of the misnomers in our industry. They're named growth companies because the companies are growing quickly. The stock price does not grow quickly. So anytime you hear growth companies, don't think, oh, the stock market's going to have really high growth. It's actually lower expected returns than their antithesis, which is the value companies. So the value companies are the ones with higher expected returns. Growth companies actually have lower expected returns than value companies. So that's, that's one of those things where, why? Because growth companies are already doing very well. They tend to already have a very good price. So they already pr valued very highly. They'd be like Apple, the Googles, the uh, Exxon Mobil. Those would be examples of growth companies. They have very strong growth. But their stock prices reflect that because everybody knows they have strong growth. They're more likely to, to have negative news, or as likely to have negative news as positive news. Value companies would be something like Kmart or something like that where there's financial distress or they have a significant book value relative to their uh, earnings. So those tend to have the opportunity to turn around. And there's a few uh, cases amongst those thousands of names where they turn around and have 1,000%, 2,000% returns, and that's in your portfolio. It won't be a big part of your portfolio, but we'll get those because it's in there. Okay? Uh, so we tilt towards each of these factors, and the way that that's done, uh, is so Dimensional does this, and then we, we combine the funds to tilt to each of these factors, but we buy some small names. And then we'll buy some value names, right? So now there's an overlap. So these are darker yellow here in the bottom left. So we'll buy a lot more of the small value ones. And we'll buy some of the value and some of the, some of the small. And then we also buy the, the high, uh, 
high profitability names as well across that. So it becomes three dimensional. So all these kind of speckled dots across the way where it becomes darker or high profitability. So as you layer these on top, the ones that are really dark, that's all three of these factors will be significantly overweighted relative to the other names. The ones that are two of the factors will be fairly overweighted. The ones that have one factor will be overweighted just a little bit. And the ones that don't have those factors will be underweighted significantly. So that's actually how those funds are created underneath the chassis. Um, or underneath the hood, the chassis is the bottom. I don't know cars very well. Um, so that's actually how those funds are created underneath the hood is that, that kind of an overweight where it's layered on top of each other. In case you're curious about what's actually inside of those funds, that gives you a little bit of a visual representation of that. Um, so let's talk about those funds. DFA, Dimensional Fund Advisors, you've heard the name. One of the best ways to measure a fund company, it's really hard to measure a fund company over the last year. The best, one of the best ways to measure a fund company is looking back at their longest uh, existent uh, funds and saying, so what this is is saying all the funds that DFA has had for at least 15 years or more, how have they ranked relative to all the funds that existed at that time? So down here in the yellow is the funds that have gone away. They've been closed down, typically because they have poor performance, they've been rolled into another fund, examples like that. So these funds don't even exist anymore, the ones in yellow. The ones in blue did worse than DFA, and the ones in gray beat DFA's fund in that asset class. So each of these is different funds. Uh, they're ranked within their asset class with the other funds that were in that asset class at the time that they started. And these are all the funds, not cherry picking, these are all the funds that DFA had uh, that have at least 15 years of history. What you'll see here is DFA, if you average these out, comes around to 90 percentile. 90th percentile of all the funds that existed at the time these funds were launched is a pretty good grade. I'd take a solid 90. Some of them are A pluses, some are B pluses, but overall you're getting an A, solid A investment with DFA. It's reliable, it's consistent, it's not that there's you know, big, you know, huge winners and they have other funds that are losers. They're very consistent and that's what Align was looking for when they found Dimensional separate from us and that's what we were looking for when we found Dimensional and that's why we use Dimensional in a big part of your portfolio is because of that consistency, it's because of the singles and the doubles that Brian was talking about earlier. That's what, that's what they're all about. So this is actually in practice. This is the, you know, so often we get asked where's the, where's the actual proof? Where's the, where's the actual um, real world examples of how these companies have done? Here's that real world example on the, on the fund side. Dennis showed you the real world example on Align and with their investments and what your, your investments have done within Align, uh, Align's models. This is what DFA has done in the real world after fees. Okay. That's, that was my presentation. Um, I'll wrap it up just kind of generally, but if, if people have questions, take a few questions. Oh. Yeah. Questions? Anybody? Anybody? Honestly, All right. Oh, come on, there's no more questions. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your. Oh, we got one. I need a little bit of education on the television, the video, or the media market is spending millions of dollars trying to convince me that I should buy some gold and silver. <laughs> so, in the last 20 years or 15 years, if I bought $50,000 worth of gold and silver, it would be more or less today than 15 let, let me actually go a little further back to 200 years ago. If you take gold, if you take gold and go back to uh, I forget the exact date, sometime in the 1800s, uh, there's a study by one of the professors that looks at gold and what the price appreciation of gold has been, and it is almost exactly inflation. That's it. It has very big positive swings and it has very big negative swings. The price of gold was thirty-two dollars. Yeah. I'm getting pretty old. Correct. Keep in mind that inflation, so the inflation over time compounds significantly. Uh -huh. So you gotta do on an after inflation basis what that would have been compounded to. But there's also the fact that the recent history, the last 50 or 60 years has been a very, very good period for gold. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're, they're saying that uh, with this, what, $200 trillion, the 200 or 20, our deficit. 20, 20, yeah, that's, the, that's the risk. They're saying uh, if something happens, you should have your own stuff. 
Yeah. If something happens, you should have guns and tuna fish. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. No. Yeah. Uh, one of my friends says you ought to have soap. Soap? Soap, soap would be good, That'd too. That would be important, too. <laughs> soap is good. Yeah. Soap and toilet paper. <laughs> soap and toilet paper. That's probably more useful than gold. You can't, yeah. you know, can't clean with gold. Um, but anyway, uh, that's a commodity, I guess. Commodity, commodities, on average, have the expected yeah. return of inflation. They are, they are physical goods. They are goods that do not uh, progenerate. They do not create something. So if a gold bar sits on the table and you go back to it 20 years later, it's still a single gold bar. Companies, the th reason that companies compound like they do is because that company takes seeds and they plant 10 seeds into the ground. They get eight or nine plants because one of them dies. They get a lot more seeds back and they can plant 40 the next time. And then they can plant 120 the next time. The ability to compound within the company is where that, that compounding in companies comes from. Something that remains a physical good and is held doesn't compound like that. The price may go up and it may go down, but gold's a great example. If you go back in time, 200 year plus years ago, it has not compounded over that time. It's, it's kept up with inflation, right? but it has not been a great investment in the long term. I saw one from, I think it was if you bought it, and again, I, I think it was like in 1980, after we had the big run up in what, 2009, 10, mm -hmm. you know, it ran up, that you just then broke even with inflation. It, so it gold, gold it entirely depends on when yeah. you buy because it it's so volatile. Yeah. So it, it, what period you're looking at, it can look fantastic and it look, can look terrible. But if you t take as long as, uh, it, the longest history I've ever seen on gold says it's approximately inflation. Tim? What can you tell us about digital currencies? Who's your expectations are? Who's behind them? So you want me to explain how Bitcoin works? <laughs> yeah. Well, no. Can you? I can't. <laughs> I can't tell you. The, the simplest explanation I have, and this is not this is not my area of expertise, but the simplest explanation I have is that there is a a public record that is distributed amongst lots and lots of computers such that if you tried to edit that public record, you'd only be able to access any one point and the system would know that you tried to tamper with that. Huh. And so it's able to keep track of all of the, the who owns the currencies because that transaction record is held so publicly and so distributed that you can't mess with the transactions. You wouldn't be able to hack all of the different people that are holding those transactions. So that's the general premise of, of digital currencies as I understand them for how they're secure. What do you think secure. the future holds for the digital currency? Man. It'll be used for transactional purposes because you can transact very, very efficiently. I have no idea whether it will appreciate or not. Um, like any currencies, I, it's very hard to predict currency uh, expectations on which currencies are going to do well and which currencies are going to do poorly. Um, so I don't have an expectation on that. Who's it's, behind them? Who's behind them? They're, so they're, the one guy started it's Bitcoin? actually unclear whether or not that yeah. guy started it. So, but there's one guy who has claimed who has been vetted by other programmers to be the most likely creator of it. But it is it basically who's behind it is anyone who creates an exchange for Bitcoin are the ones who keep those public transactions and make sure that it's, it's maintained out there in the public Where space. So if all the, all, if all the people that <laughs> maintain wallets and, and the exchanges for the Bitcoin close down their computers, the, the Bitcoins would disappear. There's, no, there's nothing that would be at the bank level or federal government or any government that would step in and say, no, these are correct transactions. It's, it's held in a distributed manner. So mm. I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not an expert, but that's as much as I know about Bitcoin. Because there's others. In, there are others. Bitcoin. Yeah. There are. There's three or four now. That's more than I knew about it right there in it, five minutes. Yeah, it's cryptocurrencies <laughs> is kind of the, the common name for it. Uh, entities like... Um, I, eventually, there will probably be something that is more backed by banks or a mm. government entity, but currently there's not. They're, they're very efficient for transacting because you literally, it's just, it's just bits and bytes. But so it makes sense that in the future, mm -hmm. the digital currencies. It does make sense. Yeah. I wouldn't trust it right now, though. That's for sure. No. no, no there's, been, there's been huge. Uh, it runs on different digital currencies whenever exchanges have closed because there have been exchanges that have just shut down that have had been hacked into or, or had things happen so it, it's a it's a nascent market it's not one that I have an opinion on it's not one I'm going to personally invest in 
It's one of those discrete outcomes. You're either going to end up with zero or a lot of money. You don't know which one it's going to be. <laughs> Question. Are any of these slides or the presentation available on your website? We are going to put the video on our website and it will have the slides in it, yes. Or if you want to, you know, we'd be happy to share them with you if you want directly. You down your, uh, yeah. your name, your email, and stuff, we're happy to send sure. you the whole presentation. Yeah, we'd be more than happy to. Um, I'll wrap this up. So, a lot of what Jonathan went through here, uh, some of you might have recognized, like in our investment philosophy brochure, you've read at some point, especially, you know, more recently if you've, you've seen that. But some of the, the question we get is, okay, this sounds good. I mean, that's great information, but does it work? And so what I decided to do to kind of wrap it up is, here's what's going on behind the scenes. We believe in it. We've got our money in it, but does it work? Because I went back and, and looked at our portfolio management system and said, okay, let's start in one of the more painful periods of January 1st of 2008. And where were we? And where are we now? So here you see this gold line is the money all our clients have invested, that you've invested with our firm. And the blue line is what you have at, at these different points. So you see here, I mean, this was painful right here. I mean, there's what you put in, there's where we were throughout 2008. And we appreciate you sticking with us and trusting us and trusting your plan. So we sat with a lot of you and said, Plan says you're okay, keep going, go on that trip. Or you know, maybe it wasn't, let's make some adjustments. But you stuck with it. And you, you, know, you actually see money was still coming in. So you, you know, here you see there's a pretty big gap now. Here's where uh, that line is where you invested. And as of August 1st, the net investment that we have is 181 million, but our accounts are 243 million. So you as clients have made Sixty-two and a half million dollars since January first of two thousand eight. So I'd say it works. Well, and I, I think a lot of that. This all this would not have worked if you guys had not trusted us and had confidence in us. Right. So you know, it worked because you, you know, you, you didn't get you know, We appreciate that trust and confidence, and you do not take it lightly. So it worked for a lot of reasons. The data is real, it's clean, the strategy works, it's sound. But if you don't if you don't have the money entrusted to, you know, as a financial advisor, if you don't keep the money invested, it wouldn't work. So it, it was a collaborative thing amongst yeah. everybody and all of us. Too often what happens is people get out right there. I know that and it's so strange, but it's kinda like a pendulum. I mean, it was on this way, and eventually it was back. Yep, and it happens quick. Yep. That's right. Whenever it gets out of whack, but thanks for the confidence. That's it. Any questions? Thank you all. All right, thanks so much.